Imagine you could step inside the minds of Canada's healthcare leaders, glimpse their greatest fears, strongest drivers, and what makes them tick. Welcome to Healthcare Changemakers, a podcast where we talk to leaders about the joys and challenges of driving change and working with partners to create the safest healthcare system. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Herox Healthcare Changemakers podcast. I'm Mark Aiello, Communications and Marketing Specialist at Herox, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Philip D'Souza. For this episode, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Frank Martino, President and CEO of the William Osler Health System. Welcome, Frank, and thank you so much for taking a moment to chat with us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Mark. We've definitely been looking forward to speaking with you, so let's jump right into it. So it's been over a year and a bit now since you were officially announced as Osler's President and CEO. What's been your biggest lesson so far leading one of Canada's largest community hospital systems? There are multiple lessons, I believe. Uh, I think I can say I learned many things. Um, but if I were to uh, focus on one, I, I, I think the first lesson is always to remain positive and, and, and aim high. Uh, so uh, this is an organization that is planning for uh, the future of healthcare in our community. And so we need to aim high. Um, we're the leading ho- uh, one of the leading hospital systems in the in the province, certainly one of the largest uh, community hospitals in both Ontario and uh, I would say Canada uh, as a multi-site hospital system. And um, Osler's got a, a bright and exciting future. We're embarking on, on some uh, ambitious large-scale initiatives. We're going to be um, adopting uh, very shortly uh, uh, an advanced hospital information system that really changes the culture within an organization as you move to this um, this huge huge opportunity to to sort of advance the the workflow the the uh, quality of the of the um, care that you provide with an advanced uh, health information system or hospital information system that's going to happen very shortly. And uh, it will mean culture change to some degree, but I can say that the the healthcare team is so excited about this. Uh, when I um, uh, took on the role of president CEO, numerous people stopped me or sent me emails or or phone calls. Please, please assure that this is one of your priorities, and it definitely is. We're also going to be embarking on some um, challenging. Um, uh, redevelopment projects uh, with the creation of the second hospital in Brampton at Peel Memorial, our, our old Peel Memorial site, and uh, building a, uh, a comprehensive cancer center that will focus uh, on, on the patient's entire journey uh, when they're diagnosed with cancer from diagnosis to treatment and to uh, the survivorship program. Most importantly, we'll be able to provide radiation oncology services uh, for the residents of our region. And to top it all off, we're also going to be partnering as the primary affiliate of the uh, Metropolitan uh, Toronto Metropolitan University's uh, new School of Medicine. That's an exciting wow. venture for us as we move from becoming a, um, a large community hospital to an academic health center. So <clears throat> I think the other thing I've really learned, it's, it's important to have uh, significant partnerships. Uh, right. A, any organization can't do it alone. Uh, our C- uh, Central West Ontario uh, Health Team, TMU, um, other academic partners we've been affiliated with, government, uh, our community health partners, uh, both locally and regionally, and other hospital systems that we collaborate with. Um, that's sort of been our our mantra going forward, uh, strong partnerships really allow you to achieve great things. And um, and then I think the other thing that I've learned is that I've got an outstanding healthcare team. Um, they provide exceptional care every every day. They're unwavering in their commitment. I've realized that as I go from uh, unit to unit at all three of our sites, uh, actually at all five of our sites, because many people don't know that we actually have a, um, a substance abuse uh, uh, treatment center um, we, uh, outside of our, our walls in the community that we uh, run, manage, and, um, and uh, 
provide those services to the community. We also have a, um, a reactivation center for patients with com complex continuing care and reactivation rehabilitation as part of the, uh, the old uh, uh, Queen Street site of the Humber River Hospital. And so those are the sites that I visit. And there I really realized that this team is committed and dedicated. We uh, were very, very proud of receiving accreditation with exemplary standing, uh, something that, um, you know, it is the highest uh, achievement uh, that you would receive from Accreditation Canada. And uh, that really sort of um, allowed my staff to understand that they were uh, Outstanding. They were exceptional yes. healthcare workers and continue to be. Now, there have been a few other uh, big uh, Hallmark things, but you know, aim high and always be positive. I really love uh, your answer, Dr. Martino, because, you know, like you said, aiming high with all those incredible projects you have going on, as it sounds like, you know, your hospital and the Osler Health System is is going through this revolution at the moment. But I, I love your points about partnerships, you know, relying on one another and, and building those strong partnerships uh, to improve. And, and then also, yeah, have, you know, looking at your team and learning just how uh, uh, resilient and, and, and powerful uh, your team is. Uh, to, to build back uh, from from the pandemic. And so I, I'd ask, you know, what, what's been the most rewarding part of, of being a hospital CEO so far? I think, you know, the most rewarding uh, part of being a CEO is it's just watching them in action. You know, uh, I've watched our staff of physicians um, come out of the pandemic, um, and it, it's been immensely rewarding to to uh, see them in action during the pandemic, and then uh, the pride they 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 demonstrated in in surviving. Well, we were one of the hardest hit hospitals in right. Ontario and maybe in Canada. At one point, we transferred out more than a thousand patients. We stabilized and transferred out a thousand patients. We saw more COVID patients probably than any other health system. And during that period of time, they showed innovation, resilience. Coming out of that, uh, certainly there there was uh, there and continues to be work on on uh, recovery. But I've watched them, um, you know, uh, show fortitude, uh, resilience, and um, and a positive outlook. Uh, whether it's our externs that come and work for, uh, with us uh, through the externship program as nursing students, uh, as allied health professionals, our new physicians, and we've recruited quite a number uh, and expanded our medical staff. Um, watching them, that's what makes me incredibly proud. You know, and it is probably, not as probably, it certainly is the most rewarding part of the job. Now, that's a fantastic, fantastic answer. Um, if, and, and, you know, to to go to the next question, if I'm not mistaken, you you joined Osler in 1991, um, and you've been serving uh, the brand community ever since. In your experience, Frank, with this with this community and and Canada's health system in general, how has healthcare changed uh, since 1991? You know, when I used to drive up the then relatively new 4410 into Brampton, um, or for that matter, up. Um, Highway 427 towards Etobicoke General, uh, those were new communities. There wasn't the huge uh, 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 suburban sprawl that we see today. The sign, I think the Brampton sign said 207,000 people. Oh, wow. Uh, we're, we're probably, if, uh, if you were to count um, those who are residents here but are not accounted for in any census, um, because they may not have status, um, we're probably up to 800,000 people uh, or thereabouts. Uh, the sign says something like 670, but I, I can guarantee there are many more than that. Um, certainly this community has uh, been a challenge because it is a community that has evolved. I'm extremely proud and, and uh, privileged to be in a, such a diverse and growing community uh, that brings uh, so so much richness to 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 the fabric of the community. Um, we have one of the highest rates of diabetes in, uh, in the country. And as you can imagine, diabetes is a chronic condition that brings with it um, a number of complex complications, health complications that we manage every day from cardiovascular disease to kidney disease to, to vi uh, complications affecting one's vision, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we as an organization have had to evolve 
Um, uh, and we've had to expand. We've had back-to-back -back redevelopments in our health system, expanding the, uh, the capacity that this community deserves. Uh, primary care has evolved as well. Uh, back in 1990, I worked um, in managing uh, with my colleagues in, in our health group, um, family medicine group, uh, inpatients from uh, the moment they were admitted, if they needed to be admitted to the IC or CCU, we were the primary physicians, the most responsible physicians in providing their care. I delivered babies just until last year. Wow. And I worked in all three emergency departments, uh, well, the two emergency departments, uh, Brampton Civic and Etobicoke General, and in our urgent care, which, which is open 24-7 at Peel Memorial. I worked in those departments until just this past uh, May. And so I've seen the community evolve. Um, healthcare in this community is much more complex. Uh, the demographics of the community has grown, has changed. Uh, we are now seeing a significant rise in our, our seniors population, the second fastest rise in that demographic, demographic group uh, in the country. When you add all that together, this is a much, a much more complex health care community and um, one that brings uh, significant challenges. Uh, and that is what we focus on at Osler. And, and addressing those challenges uh, with innovative uh, uh, projects, innovative initiatives, um, um, assuring that we communicate with uh, our community. Uh, we go to them for advice when uh, a new initiative or a strategy is being put in place. We want to make sure we get the, the patient and the, their caregiver, uh, the carers, their, um, their perspective. On, um, on how we should grow programs and what initiatives and innovations we should put in place and whether they actually work for them. And I think this collaborative spirit um, uh, blends well with our staff and with the organization. Uh, it's part of our plan going forward, Peel Memorial, for instance, going to the community and saying, these are the services we're going to put them there. How would you like them delivered? What is missing? What isn't? And it's also part of our partnership with uh, TMU. I think if you look at, at the pillars on which this new medical school is going to be built, they reflect the, the values, uh, uh, Osler's values. And those of TMU, they intersect perfectly. And that's what we're proud of, in engaging with these kind of partners and assuring that um, health quality health care is delivered. One area I worry about, and I'll, I'll be... Uh, uh, very uh, transparent about that, and, and my colleagues in, in that specialty are also concerned, is primary care. Primary care has had uh, a difficult time during the pandemic when family doctors had to go to virtual care. That connection, that the narrative with your patient was, uh, was over the phone or on the video screen. It was no longer in person. Um, and those relationships, those important relationships that really have created the foundation of Canadian healthcare, family medicine, uh, have been slightly eroded. I can't say that um, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to recover those. I'm, I'm confident we will. I'm confident that the, the family doctors in this country are committed to um, the resurgence of primary care. And that's seen well in our uh, Ontario health teams, the importance of integrated health care. And I'm actively involved at the uh, uh, Canadian College of Family Physicians, and I know that the spirit there is to really regenerate, reinvigorate uh, primary care. And I'm starting to see it in our community as more and more of our family doctors are interested in becoming teachers as part of the TMU uh, School of Medicine, which will be, uh, in interestingly, many people may not be aware, and I hope that uh, this becomes uh, well known throughout um, uh, the healthcare community. This medical school will focus on generalism. It will focus on family medicine. Um, it will focus on pediatrics, general surgery, um, emergency medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, psychiatry, those specialties that are linked to generalism. And uh, I believe that it will provide the, the much needed uh, health human resource this community needs. Someday, and this has been a discussion I've had with um, uh, Mohammed Leshmi, the uh, President and CEO of, of TMU, we want to create uh, a faculty of health sciences. 
where there is that integrated approach to delivering uh, health care. And it's taught that way. It's taught that way in the foundation, at the grassroots, when you become a, a nurse, a physician, a uh, respiratory technologist, a physiotherapy, that you're actually learning with your other colleagues around you in a team approach to learning and care delivery. And that faculty of health sciences, I think, will be a, an outstanding contribution to our community and its future. Um, so I look forward to that. I'm extremely excited about that. Over the years, Dr. Martino, when you think back, uh, what's been your favorite, uh, most heartwarming work memory from over the year, if you if you could pick one? If I can think of one that I'll never forget. Yeah. This was a, a, a I was um, a young emergency physician back in the days of uh, my work at Peel Memorial, when Peel Memorial was the the one uh, hospital in Brampton. And uh, and I remember this child who was, I think, three or four years of age, and he was jumping on the couch and fell off and landed on a oh, glass no. table and had a large laceration in his neck. Um, his father brought him into the emergency department uh, in his arms. He had driven uh, the child in from home. They couldn't wait for an ambulance. They were panicking. And this child was pre-arrest. Uh, he was somewhat blue, uh, pale. He lost a significant amount of blood. And I mobilized the team. Uh, one of my emergency physician colleagues was just coming on shift. I was coming off shift. Um, and a um, uh, plastic surgeon who happened to have been walking through the department five minutes earlier, I called back in. Um, we um, mobilized our general surgeon, uh, who's now retired. He was a patient of mine and continues to be a patient of mine. Um, and um, he, this young man had a primary, after we resuscitated, stabilized him, transfused him, uh, got him ready for the operating room, he had, and actually had a primary repair of the external jugular vein that he lacerated. Um, and um, he was uh, taken to the operating room. That repair was done, and he was then transferred to hospital for sick children. I called the hospital the next day, and the uh, the uh, surgical fellow came on the phone. He he wanted to know the name of the surgeon. He said, you know what? This particular surgeon is a family friend when we lived in Montreal and, and found out this surgeon actually did. Uh, he was a general surgeon, did a fellowship in uh in vascular surgery, so he was quite prepared to have done what this child needed. And the uh, fellow said, and you can hear in the background, I'm actually in the patient's room. He's uh, recovered, running around, uh -huh. and uh, we're going to be sending him home tomorrow morning. So he had a very short stay at the hospital for sick children. Um, at the time, we were part of a, a hospital system that included uh, Georgetown Hospital, and I um, uh, was working a, a, an emergency shift at Georgetown, and this father, uh, he came in and he said, uh, do you know who this is? And I said, I'm sorry, sir, I, I don't. Uh, he said, uh, then he mentioned the name, and I looked at the child and went, oh, my God. Child, this was about five or six years later, maybe seven years later. Child was probably 10, 11 years old. He says, you saved his life. Oh, my goodness powerful it was it was um it was one of those moments that um uh, make you quite emotional and you um and you uh you don't forget yeah really. yeah well, absolutely no thank you so much for for sharing that if i had to think of something else that wasn't so personal and private as that um i would say that accreditation last year um, oh was, yeah uh, outstanding for the organization you know we uh, i think we scored uh, 99.83. There were only six out of 3,600 standards we didn't meet as an organization. We met all the um, uh, uh, the priority standards uh, that gave us uh, accreditation with exemplary status, but imagine only six. And interestingly, my team challenged those six. I think we scored all. I said, no, stand back, <laughs> take the uh, feedback, see how yeah. you can improve. But it was a moment of extreme pride in standing in front of them and being able to give them those results and, uh, yeah. and congratulate them was uh, certainly a heartwarming experience. Thank you so much for sharing those those moments. Those are yeah, the, those are the moments that make it all uh, worth it. You know, um, yeah, I know that was excellent. Um, 
for the next question. You know, when when we spoke last, uh, you may have shared your thoughts on on something such as innovative thinking as a continuous process. Uh, do you mind sharing a bit more information on that topic for our listeners? Maybe uh, explaining how it connects to a culture of uh, patient safety. If you look at Osler's values, one uh, value that we actually almost purposely put in place. Um, it was the value of innovation. Um, you know, there is compassion, uh, there is excellence, uh, uh, a number of Osler values that speak to uh, quality of care, but innovation is, is one that for us comes from the grassroots. One thing we do at Osler, that's something many organizations have come to observe and try to emulate is our iHuddle boards. And these were developed in-house and, and there are large TV screens that are in, a, in the area within a, a unit where the staff will come together on a daily basis and, um, and review um, you know, real-time information at the local level and across our Osler sites. And, this, these huddle boards were recognized by health, the Health Standards Organization as a global leading practice. Uh, they allow the team to um, um, focus on initiatives at the local level, see what uh, Osler initiatives are in play and how they can uh, more, uh, more effectively advance those. Uh, the team has uh, embraced uh, huddle boards. When I go and do uh, rounding, we we call it "Let's Be Frank" um, oh. uh, <laughs> or "Frank Conversations." They use my first name, "Frank yeah. Conversations," or "Let's Be Frank." And I and at these "Frank Conversations," we work around the huddle board, and it's been a huge success. You know, if I think about um, the uh, butterfly model for dementia care, which is uh, a model of care that looks at at the patient's emotional response to dementia and addressing that. Um, these units are different when you, um, and we're one of, and we are the first acute care hospital in the world to adopt the butterfly model. It exists in a number of long-term care homes and, and other, um, non-acute care facilities, but we were the first to adopt it. We've been, a, we received accreditation for that. Uh, this model has been visited by a number of organizations trying, uh, who are, uh, not trying, I hope they will. Uh, emulate this because I think it really changes the uh, the journey for the patient with dementia and um, uh, a different unit the colors the 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 staff and the way they address and work with the patient the 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 layout of the facility looks so much different I wish if you had an opportunity one day to actually visit we're so proud to take people around and show them exactly what we've done on our butterfly units. And yeah, that'd be lovely. Acute care of the elderly units are uh, all butterfly units now. The one at Brampton Civic and the one at Etobicoke General is transforming as well. And uh, these are, um, you know, in initiatives, innovations that uh, really have made a, different for the, a difference for our, our staff and for our patients. Our job is really to keep an eye on the future, uh, really uh, look at, at what healthcare will be like in uh, 10, 20, 30 years. One area that we're going to start to focus on, and we don't, we don't want to be laggers, we want to be leaders in that area, is looking at how artificial intelligence actually, uh, how it becomes part of the way we deliver care in the future, harnessing it in an effective way. Uh, both in our workflow and um, in the way we intersect with patients. So uh, our team is going to uh, aggressively look at uh, uh, AI and uh, assess how it can be best harnessed. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that with extreme excitement. We spoke a lot about uh, uh, culture uh, today uh, so far, and I wanted to ask, you know, how do you go about building a strong organizational culture, especially one, you know, that uh, that prioritizes respect and inclusiveness for your staff, uh, patient-centered care, and of course, engagement with the surrounding community? I think culture is what really defines an organization. Um, we at Osler uh, look at people as uh, one of our foundational enablers to our strategic plan and our strategic direction. Um, you know, we are, we, we are to deliver patient-inspired healthcare without boundaries. To achieve that, um, you need uh, to have the people component of your organization 
inspired to provide uh, the best care for both patients and families. You know, we look at where there may be issues with uh, culture and we're constantly uh, addressing those and assuring that the culture stays uh, paramount in, um, in the uh, vision of, uh, of the organization. Um, if you were to uh, ask me how we support that, you know, we came out of a, a very difficult pandemic and through the recovery, we, we realized that it is important to both uh, uh, provide the uh, resources to, for staff to uh, be resilient, uh, to engage in health and wellness and uh, to create a safe and healthy workplace environment, both from a physical, but importantly, from a psychological perspective. So we, uh, we are in a no blame culture uh, and, and, and uh, emphasize models of, of positive behaviors. Uh, that is how you achieve quality care. Uh, otherwise, uh, learning from your failures, and I, I've been reading a book, uh, The Right Kind of Wrong by um, Amy Edmondson, that looks at how you learn from failure and not to be afraid of it. And we uh, ask our staff uh, to uh, live in that world of psychological safety so we can have uh, the best and highest quality healthcare for our patients. That sounds superb. I, I really liked your point. Uh, of course, the whole the whole emphasis on on you know uh, focusing on your people, your people strategy, but uh, particularly the point about you know looking at those positive uh, behaviors, those behavior models that uh, you know you'd like uh, um, staff to kind of embody and, and represent. I, I really li- like that idea of you know working with your staff, establishing psychological safety, and and uh, uh, you know uh, hearing from them, seeing what they want, and and, and you know recognizing their aspirations. It's that was a, a really lovely uh, uh, answer. My next question talks about you know mentorship. Have you had a mentor or, or, or mentors uh, during your career? And, and if so, is there one piece of advice that has stayed with you? I've had a number, I, I must say. I, I'm, I'm just uh, um, uh, thinking about that and it brings a, a smile to my face. Well, one mentor once told me, you need to surround your yeses with a lot of no's. <laughs> uh, so you need to focus on the things you know you can achieve and, and do them well. And, um, and prioritize. Um, another mem- mentor said, really think about what you want and not what others tell you you should be doing, uh, but what you want to do and then make those appropriate choices. You know, I've been blessed in my life to have chosen a career that, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, or I aspired to uh, since I was a child. So, you know, I, I've never gone, I've never really worked you know, because I love my job. So it's never been work for me. And, um, and sometimes you want to do everything and you should only be doing what you need to do and what you should be doing as opposed to uh, doing everything. And mentors over the years have, have helped me focus um, on the achievable and, and, and beyond. Um, and they've been, um, you know, individuals that have um, uh, taught me and uh, when I was uh, a research student in uh, Northern Italy, Guido Forni, who is a now retired uh, professor of immunology, when I did my research in Turin, um, to um, colleagues uh, in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Toronto at uh, McMaster University, uh, David Price, uh, David Tenenbaum, um, you know, Francine Lemire, who and Cal Gutkin, who are former CEOs of the College of Family Physicians of Canada, um, you know, individuals who've um, watched my career in medical leadership evolve, like um, the former Deputy Minister Bob Bell, who uh, uh, took me to breakfast one day when I was considering the job of uh, CEO of the organization and said uh, very clearly, um, why wouldn't you do this? And give me the reasons why. Um, those are the individuals that have inspired me over the years um, and have sort of led and guided my career. Uh, all have provided me numerous um, antidotes and, and, um, and solutions to, to the challenges that I've faced. And um, um, I will, you know, I mean, in, in huge gratitude. I still remember Matt Anderson uh, taking me to his office one day. I was at the end of my uh, 
sort of towards the end of my term as chief family medicine. He said, uh, so what do you want to do? And I started rhyming out some things that probably were things that I hadn't truly considered as, as future initiatives. And he says, well, why don't you become chief of staff? I said, <laughs> I can't be chief of staff. He says, of course you can. He goes, he said to me, he said, you know, when I spoke to one of my mentors on who are the possibilities internally for chief, for the chief of staff role, you were the first name that came up. And, and I asked him, can a family doctor do this job? And I remember Sandy Buckman, who was president of the CMA and of the CFPC, uh, said to me once, you need to be a family doctor to really do this job because you have an understanding of all the other specialties, how important they are and how they intersect. And uh, so I think that was the, um, the moment that I realized that, you know, it's best not to stay in the gallery and it's important to go to the front of the room. That sounds like a, an incredible, uh, incredible group of people to, to look to uh, for inspiration. I've, I've written down, you know, uh, what you said at the at the top of your answer, surround your yeses with a lot of noes in terms of, you know, prioritizing and, and you know, prioritizing your goals. And uh, especially when, uh, you know, focusing on your career and, and thinking about, you know, things like what's next or and so on. It's Philip here from the production studio. I have a couple of questions. Actually, yeah. I added questions, but no, I really enjoyed your talk. I took lots of notes down. My first question, what's one piece of advice or a couple of pieces of advice you would give to either emerging healthcare leaders or, you know, just um, your peers on kind of how you've sustained this amazing culture and how you stay connected to, to, to staff? I must say, I think I'm probably advantaged in the fact that I'm a family physician and uh, Family medicine is built on relationships and, um, and, and the narrative, um, and that's extremely important. Um, Ian McQuinney, um, many feel as the father of family medicine in Canada, was a um, teacher, a professor of family medicine in, uh, at the University of Western Ontario, and he spoke about the narrative and the relationship uh, the, uh, relationships that you need to create to be successful as a family doctor, and also I believe as a leader. Um, it, creating those relationships with your frontline staff, with your, um, with your uh, leaders, leaders within your organization. Not, and I'm not talking about your executive team. I'm talking about the directors, the managers, the resource nurses, the team leaders, uh, the medical directors, um, the, ch- the, the corporate uh, chiefs. Um, creating those relationships um, and creating a narrative with them, not for them, not from them, but with them. And that means you need to go almost uh, daily, if not daily, two or three times a week into the wards. Uh, you don't have to be announced. Sometimes it's great, you know, if it's organized and, you know, and you have a few uh, important um, initiatives or issues you want to talk about. But sometimes just going in, uh, Saying hello to the the, the clerical associate, um, to the charge nurse, to the uh, the um, unit nurse, uh, to the physiotherapist, walking into the rehab uh, uh, clinic and and talking to them, going into the outpatient department and talking to the staff there, and um, understanding their challenges. You'll start to see trends, you'll start to see themes, and you can start to work on those with them. And they will have many of the answers you'll need. And I think if I were to give anyone advice is get out of your office, get out, out, of, your, uh, out of your chair and, uh, and walk. I love walking meetings. You know, if someone wants to have a meeting, I'm starting to get back to that. During the pandemic, I had to stop it. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yes. I'm starting to get back where someone says, can I meet with you at 1030? I said, I'd say, yeah, meet me at my office. We're going to go for a walk. Yeah. I love that. And I think that's important that visibility is important and, and, uh, and ga- engagement is extremely important. I love that advice. No, that's really great. No, our listeners will appreciate that. Um, and I know you talked about uh, you know like, uh, directing and script writing. You should definitely, when we interviewed Dr. Brian Goldman, he also wrote a script. <laughs> he sent a script somewhere. So you should definitely connect with Dr. Mm-hmm. Goldman. You guys can uh, be a duo, directing duo. Well, you don't know this, but. Um, um, uh, when I was training in family medicine, uh, we had to do a couple of months of um, 
community hospital. That, though Mount Sinai is not considered a community hospital, it <laughs> was where we did our community hospital rotation. So I worked with Brian um, oh. there and um, Harold Fisher and um, and um, uh, 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 Eric Latovsky. He was um, quite a uh, an, and, and a good colleague and friend of mine at the time. Was also one of my teachers, oh. Tim Rutledge from. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, so we, you know, maintain those friendships. And um, so I've been following Brian's career. Um, I, I must say, I, I, I saw some of that uh, back in uh, 1989, 90, when I was training. Um, and I'm so pleased and proud that he's done what he's done. It's fantastic. And um, I guess my last book, I, oh, I think I heard you right when you said you studied, you went to Italy, you were in the North, Northern Italy and studied, is that what you said earlier? Yes, yes. I did um, um, st- uh, research in tumor immunology. Ah, and interestingly, cool. we were working on um, interleukins. Um, interleukins are these um, uh, uh, cytokines that are produced by cells, almost uh, humoral products that uh, affect the um, the function of cells and systems. And interleukins uh, at the time were being used, uh, uh, examined as um, modulators for uh, cancer um, treatment. A lot of these are now being used as biologics. Um, oh, oh, wow. These immune modulators, many are, are used in, in uh, 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 cancers, um, like uh, uh, my, um, like um, um, multiple myeloma, but also in skin cancers as melanomas. Did you like your time in Italy? Um, and did you see any, any differences in the healthcare systems? I think their healthcare system, uh, we have a lot to learn from. Um, I am a big believer in the, in, in, in the single-payer health system, I And I know my good colleague, Danielle Martin, will be proud that I'll say this. And I think that our health system is the best in the world. Uh, But they have a lot to teach us. Great uh, colleagues still work there. I have a number of cousins that are a physician, a couple of cousins that are pediatricians, and one, a couple that are cardiologists. Very cool. uh, I'm fluent. I was born there, by the way. Oh, wow. I had no idea. Where were you born? I was born in a little town back in uh, 1957 in San Nicola da Crisa in uh, southern Italy. Um, I was born at home, delivered by a midwife. Oh, no wow. way. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so I, I, I left Italy when I was a child, and um, then I went back as, a, as an adult. So both my uh, wife and I are, are, uh, speak Italian, and um, we love going back. And we're, I'm fluent, so she... Yeah, so we like going back. And my last question for you is: You mentioned you love to be in the kitchen. Do you have a do you have like a dish you're known for? Well, my mother made these um, these sort of fried meatballs called brachole, uh, and it was like you take a meatball and you deep fry it, uh, but you make it instead of round, you make it long, sort of almost a oval shape, uh, a little longer. Um, cacio pepe, uh, pasta di olio, mm. uh, carbonara. Um, uh, uh, so those are some of the dishes that, that I like to make. I, I, you know, I make veal and chicken cutlets, um, uh, some interesting, uh, uh, salads. Oh my goodness. This sounds delicious. I know. <laughs> Salivating. Grill, uh, <laughs> some Mediterranean, um, uh, sea bream and other, um, uh, fish. Now it's time, uh, Dr. Martino, for the lightning round of the interview. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and you can either answer them with one word, a sentence, or however you want. Really, it's, it's up to you. So the first one is, if you could have one superpower for a day, what would it be and why? Well, I wouldn't call it a superpower. I'd, I'd call it the ability to have a transporter <laughs> like they do on Star Trek. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? Yeah. Um, uh, or even uh, the other superpower would be able to go uh, forward and back in time. What book or movie would you say helped influence your leadership approach? I think if I could speak to a movie that talked about the human spirit, it would have been Shawshank Redemption. If you weren't working in healthcare, what other career path uh, would you have pursued? 
movie director. Oh, <laughs> movie director, um, script writer. Oh, I have a great passion for cinema. Um, oh, right cool. now, my um, partner and I are enjoying uh, watching Italian cinema and, um, um, and have, you know, watched several movies in the last few weeks. But I've always uh, been a, a big fan of, of cinema. Um, as a child, I think I, I always wanted to be an astronaut, uh, to actually go up in space and be um, weightless and, and um, we'll look at the, the Earth and the stars and the moon f- from that vantage point. What would you say is your favorite place to relax and unwind? Oh, in the kitchen. I love to, to cook and, uh, and I'm a bit of a foodie. So uh, that would be great. Um, and sometimes just uh, with a book um, um, in my, my oasis, which is my backyard, believe it or not, and uh, yeah. just relaxing with family and friends. What's your favorite inspirational quote uh, that keeps you motivated? I don't know if I have a quote. There, there is something I watch every once in a while, and um, and it's um, um it, it, I think it's Henry V's Eve of Saint Crispin's Day. I've sent this to my executive team a couple of times, and it's the speech that Kenneth Branagh gives in the movie to inspire his troops um, uh, as they hit into battle with the French. You know, they're outflanked, and and it doesn't look good for them. But he tries to inspire them that they're going to create a legacy in what they do and brings together a sense of camaraderie, uh, esprit de corps. That um, um, I sometimes listen to that. It's about five minutes long, but it is uh, certainly something that if you haven't listened to it, I encourage you to do it. I need to check that one out, but I, I do like that uh, line of, uh, you know, create a legacy in what you do. I think that's very powerful and a great way uh, to end this uh, podcast episode. It's been such a privilege, you know, chatting with you today and uh, learning more about you, uh, your experience uh, and and what the latest is at, uh, at Osler. I really, really enjoyed our talk today and I know um, our listeners will as well. So thank you so much again for your time and uh, we should chat again soon. This was fun, I must say. We'll need to do it again. Thank you for listening. You can hear more episodes of Healthcare Changemakers on our website, heroc.com, and on your favorite podcasting apps. If you like what you hear, please rate us or post a review. Healthcare Changemakers is recorded by Heroc's communications and marketing team and produced by Podfly Productions. Follow us on Twitter at at Heroc Group or email us at communications at We'd love to hear from you.